First, then, a brief philosophical definition offered by the arch-transcendentalist Ralph Waldo Emerson, as dry and as dusty in this particular passage as he ever was. It is well known to most of my audience that the idealism of the present day acquired the name of transcendentalism from the use of that term by Immanuel Kant of Königsberg, who replied to the skeptical philosophy of Locke, which insisted that there was nothing in the intellect which was not previously in the experience of the senses, by showing that there was a very important class of ideas or imperative forms which did not come by experience, but through which experience was acquired, that these were intuitions of the mind itself. And he denominated them transcendental forms the extraordinary profoundness and precision of that man's thinking have given vogue to his nomenclature in Europe and America, to that extent that whatever belongs to the class of intuitive thought is popularly called at the present day transcendental. But transcendentalism is not just a philosophical position, it's also a mood, and An important part of that mood is a passionate eagerness for whatever is new, original, unborrowed. Emerson writes in Nature, less dryly, Our age is retrospective. It builds the sepulchers of the fathers. It writes biographies, histories, and criticism The foregoing generations beheld God and nature face to face, we through their eyes. Why should not we also enjoy an original relation to the universe? Why should not we have a poetry and philosophy of insight and not of tradition and a religion by revelation to us and not the history of theirs? Embosomed for a season in nature whose floods of life stream around and through us and invite us by the powers they supply to action proportioned to nature, why should we grope among the dry bones of the past or put the living generation into masquerade out of its faded wardrobe? The sun shines today also, There is more wool and flax in the fields. There are new lands, new men, new thoughts. Let us demand our own works and laws and worship. And finally, at least for the moment, transcendentalism is also a celebration of certain ecstatic, intense, intuitive experiences. Emerson describes one of those experiences in a great passage about a walk in the woods, crossing a bare common in snow puddles at twilight under a clouded sky without having in my thoughts any occurrence of special good fortune. I have enjoyed a perfect exhilaration I am glad to the brink of fear. In the woods, too, a man casts off his years as the snake his slough, and at what period soever of life is always a child. In the woods is perpetual youth. Within these plantations of God, a decorum and sanctity reign. A perennial festival is dressed, and the guest sees not how he should tire of them in a thousand years. In the woods we return to reason and faith. There I feel that nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity leaving me my eyes, which nature cannot repair, 
Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or parcel of God. And then, in 1874, in Danbury, Connecticut, along came Charles Ives. Uh, he came from a family of convinced Emersonian transcendentalists, beginning with his grandmother, Ives. And for all of these people, uh, especially Ives himself, Emerson was his hero. For Ives, Emerson was a great visionary who could express in words what could not quite be thought. In the same way, Ives sought to compose what could not quite yet be heard. In more tangible terms, he was inspired by Emerson to write music from his own homegrown resources and to write music which was organically processive. Ives once said he remembered his father telling him that if a man knows more about a horse than he does about heaven, he should concentrate on that horse, and that way he will surely get to heaven. And indeed, that's what Ives himself did. He, uh, his music often strikes us as a swirling collage of vernacular tunes, sacred and secular, mixed in with influences of European art music, with his own unique twist, and uh, all of this was, uh, was combined with his own musical experiments in a kind of stream of consciousness kind of continuity. Now, if we look at the violin sonatas in particular, we're going to be playing two movements, one from the second sonata and one from the fourth. Each one revels in a different kind of experience. The fourth sonata which is subtitled by Ives himself, Children's Day at the Camp Meeting, is his own version of scenes from childhood. He's reveling in, in childhood, the magic of childhood. And uh, indeed, for the transcendentalist, this was a, a thread that they picked up on quite a bit. There was a child went forth every day and the first object he looked upon and received with wonder or pity or love or dread, that object he became. And that object became part of him for the day or a certain part of the day or for many years or stretching cycles of years. The early lilacs became part of this child and grass, and white and red morning glories, and white and red clover, and the song of the Phoebe bird, and the March-born lambs, and the sow's pink faint litter, and the mare's foal, and the cow's calf, and the noisy brood of the barnyard, or by the mire of the pond side, and the fish suspending themselves so curiously <coughs> below there, and the beautiful, curious liquid, and the water plants with their graceful flat heads all became part of him. And the field sprouts of April and May became part of him. Winter grain sprouts and those of the light yellow corn and of the esculent roots of the garden and the apple trees covered with blossom and the fruit afterward and woodberries, and the commonest weeds by the road, and the old drunkard staggering home from the outhouse of the tavern whence he had lately risen, and the schoolmistress that passed on her way to the school, and the friendly boys that passed, and the quarrelsome boys, and the tidy and fresh-cheeked girls, and the barefoot negro boy and girl, and all the changes of city and country wherever he went. Emerson, too, celebrated childhood 
most intensely, though, in a sadder mood in his attempts to make sense of the death of his son, Waldo, at the age of five. I see my empty house. I see my trees repair their boughs. And he, the wondrous child whose silver warble wild outvalued every pulsing sound within the air's cerulean round, the hyacinthine boy for whom morn well might break and April bloom, the gracious boy who did adorn the world wherein to he was born, and by his countenance repay the favor of the loving day, has disappeared from the day's eye. Far and wide she cannot find him. My hopes pursue, they cannot bind him. Returned this day, the south wind searches and finds young pines and budding birches, but finds not the budding man. Nature who lost cannot remake him. Fate let him fall, fate can't retake him. Nature, fate, men, him seek in vain. The fourth violin sonata, 1906 to 1915, as I mentioned, uh, is Ives' is, uh, reveling in the joys and the magic uh, and the playfulness of childhood. Uh, and there's a quote um, from Ives about this work from which we will play just the first movement. There was usually only one children's day in these summer meetings, and the children made the most of it, often the best of it. The first movement was suggested by an actual happening. The organ practice and the fast march got to joining in each other's sounds, the loudest voices singing most of the wrong notes. Most of the second movement moves around an old favorite hymn while the accompaniment reflects the outdoor sounds of nature in those summer days, the west wind in the pines and oaks, the running brook. The third movement is the boys again marching in Gathered the River. And if we look at just the first movement, uh, we will give you, we will pull apart, tease apart some of the strands that are going to be overlaid. Uh, we will find the marching of the boys. Um, <laughs> It's an element we're going to find throughout this movement. Combined with this will be a, a hymn tune that Bela will demonstrate for you called uh, Work for the Night is Coming. And this is how it appears in one particular moment as they're combined. I should say, this is Charles practicing the organ and playing one of his father's uh, ordinary little fugue subjects that he's going to eventually have some fun with, all sorts of wrong notes coming in. So uh, let's do that one more time. <laughs> on. So he's starting to experiment there. Then a little bit further on, you can imagine the boys are marching at their own tempo and, and perhaps getting excited through the open windows in the summertime. And uh, Ives gets kind of carried away himself at the organ and it sounds something like this. <laughs> March. 
So uh, in a way, what Ives is giving us is a kind of scratch and sniff music that conjures up an experience that, you know, if one were hanging around uh, at that point, one would hear these different musics um, working together in their own unique ways. here in a couple of minutes, uh, a work of Ives that evokes community in the specific form of a revival meeting. So it seemed good to provide, to preface that movement with some transcendentalist passages that also evoke community. To be candid, Transcendentalists were ambivalent about community, and some, like Emerson in certain moods, hated it for its conformist pressures. But some, like Whitman in his great verse catalogs, loved its diversity and organic wholeness. I am of old and young, of the foolish as much as the wise, regardless of others, ever regardful of others, maternal as well as paternal, a child as well as a man, stuffed with the stuff that is coarse and stuffed with the stuff that is fine, 
one of the great nations, the nation of many nations, the smallest the same and the largest the same, a southerner soon as a northerner, a planter nonchalant and hospitable, a Yankee bound my own way, ready for trade, my joints, the limberest joints on earth and the sternest joints on earth, a Kentuckian walking the veil of the elkhorn in my deerskin leggings, a boatman over the lakes or bays or along coasts, a Hoosier, a Badger, a Buckeye, a Louisianian or Georgian, a poke easy from sand hills and pines at home on Canadian snowshoes or up in the bush or with fishermen off Newfoundland, at home in the fleet of ice boats sailing with a rest and tacking, at home on the hills of Vermont or in the woods of Maine or the Texan ranch, comrade of Californians, comrade of free Northwesterners loving their big proportions Portions, comrade of raftsmen and coalmen, comrade of all who shake hands and welcome to drink and meet, a learner with the simplest, a teacher of the thoughtfulest, a novice beginning experience of myriads of seasons, of every hue and trade and rank, of every caste and religion, not merely of the New World, but of Africa, Europe, or Asia a wandering savage, a farmer, mechanic, or artist, a gentleman, sailor, lover, or Quaker, a prisoner, fancy man, rowdy, lawyer, physician, or priest. But not even that passage perhaps evokes community as vividly as a passage written by Ives himself, a reminiscence of a camp meeting like the one the music's about to evoke. I remember, he writes, I remember how at the outdoor camp meeting services in Reading, all of the farmers, their families, and field hands for miles around would come on foot or in their farm wagons. I remember how the great waves of sound used to come through the trees when things like Beulah land, Woodworth, nearer, my God, to thee, the shining shore, Nettleton in the sweet by and by, and the like were sung by thousands of let-out souls. The music notes and words on paper were about as much like what they were at those moments as the monogram on a man's necktie may be like his face. Father, who led the singing sometimes with his cornet or his voice, sometimes with both voice and arms, and sometimes in the quieter hymns with a French horn or violin, would always encourage the people to sing in their own way. Most of them knew the words and music, their words and music, by heart, and sang it that way. If they threw the poet or the composer around a bit, so much the better for the poetry and the music. There was power and exaltation in these great conclaves of sound from humanity. of the third movement of the second violin sonata that Ives calls the revival. Uh, <clears throat> what we find here is a narrative shape that is fairly common for Ives. It's a, a kind of experimental form of his uh, where the narrative shape goes from complexity to clarification or gradual revelation where the actual tune on which the whole movement is based only appears in its unvarnished and pure and clear form at the very end, whereas the, the whole movement uh, bef up to that point is um, a set of free variations on bits of the tune. It's, in a way, it's, it, and it starts so much um, in the vapor of a mystical kind of music that it, in a way it's as if he takes this tune from its spiritual form and gives it a fleshly form at the end. Um, and you all have a handout, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. 
So uh, let's pretend we're in Danbury at one of these camp meetings, and let's sing this together because this is indeed the bedrock of the third movement. So I will play uh, the second line as an introduction, and then everybody can chime in. We'll just do one verse. you'd all had a lot of experience doing this. Uh, so what Ives does, he takes fragments. For instance, just that falling third. And already at the very beginning, again, clothed in a, a mystical kind of music. It's in the violin and the piano echoes. And then goes off. But already, that little germ cell that's going to be so much at the core of the tune is right there. Then a little bit later, uh, the head motif again appears in a very blurred version in the piano with pizzicato in the violin. Maybe we could play from here. hear that that's basically the tune the beginning of the tune and then the part that is now played in the piano uh, we'll continue from there um, slightly faster kind of eerie and now back to the mystic version in canon with the violin And little by little, there's going to be a greater amount of flesh and blood uh, uh, invested in these fragments. Um, and before we play the movement all the way through, I just want to read something from The Oversoul by Emerson, which is uh, where, in a sense, Ives gets the idea um, of starting with a welter of seemingly unrelated elements and then then coming with those elements into a state of clarification. Because what Emerson speaks about is an apparent fragmentation in existence that, that uh, hides some sort of universal truths that are basically there for us to, to tune into. So uh, Emerson says, We live in succession, in division, in parts, in particles. Meantime, within man is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. We see the world piece by piece as the sun, the moon, the animal, the tree, but the whole of which these are the shining parts is the soul. So what Ives is doing is creating a, a musical enactment of this very notion and leading us to have a kind of aha experience at the end as we uh, participate in the coming together of the tune. It's also a kind of enactment of community. Just as the tune brings itself together, so it is that individuals come together in the shared exaltation of singing. Thank you. 
third of our helices will come up and join us, Rhonda Ryder. Uh, and we're going to talk about the piano trio, the only piano trio that Ives ever wrote. Uh, and it's a three-movement work. This time, we promise we're not just going to do bits and pieces. We'll give you the whole piece in performance after the discussion. Um, interestingly, this piece seems to give us, in each movement, a different focus. The first movement seems to be a focus on intellection, uh, the process of the mind. I should first say that the whole piece is unified by uh, the fact that he's representing in all of the movements reminiscences of his days at Yale, which were very fond days for him. The first movement is uh, a philosophy discussion um, between some students on the Yale fence and a professor, rather erudite, a philosophy professor, and it's rather thorny and forbidding and harsh, actually, severe. Uh, at the same time, he's interestingly capturing the nature of following a, a complicated argument where there's a lot of digressing and uh, circuitous movement through, it's not a logical kind of thought progression, um, and what we're going to find here is that basically there'll be a duet, a dialogue between cello and piano, and then with different but similar type of material, a dialogue between violin and piano, and then all of that music will join together for a statement of, uh, a concluding statement in this movement. So that's the realm of the intellect, pure intellect, um, although there are, in the background, according to Ives, um, boys playing on the field, uh, and so there's a certain levity, perhaps, that it just in the periphery. Um, now, the second movement, which is called T-S-I-A-J, which means this scherzo is a joke, uh, and which is doubly funny because the word scherzo means joke. Uh, this is um, celebration of the realm of the physical. And uh, we will talk about that a little later. Uh, the third movement celebrates the realm of the spiritual. And um, it seems that there are a couple of common threads here. Uh, one, perhaps, is the, the relation um, that I think the transcendentalist shared with Ives, the relation between the intellect and the intuitive, the spiritual, where the intellect is considered not as, uh, as great um, and uh, taking second place to the higher realm of the intuitive. And um, the other is the nature of form versus substance. There are places in this piece that are, as I mentioned at the beginning, that Ives was quite fascinated with Emerson's putting into words things that cannot be put into words. And Ives did the same in music. He created music, and we'll show you some examples here, of music that's almost like inchoate music. It's proto-music. He's trying to capture some internal experience. And the notes and the rhythms almost don't matter, and we'll show you that particularly in the second movement. So Larry is going to um, give us some references in transcendental thought for these two concepts. Like Ives, uh, Emerson, given a an unqualified choice, preferred intuition to intellect and content to form, and gave thoughtful elaboration of those preferences in two passages from his essays. Our inquiry, he writes, leads us to that source, at once the essence of genius, of virtue, and of life, which we call spontaneity or instinct. We denote this primary wisdom as intuition, whilst all later teachings are tuitions. In that deep force, the last fact behind which analysis cannot go, all things find their common origin. For the sense of being which in calm hours rises, we know not how in the soul is not diverse from things, from space, from light, from time, from man, but one with them, and proceeds obviously from the same source whence their life and being also proceed. We first share the life by which things exist, 
and afterwards see them as appearances in nature and forget that we have shared their cause. And if we ask whence this comes, if we seek to pry into the soul that causes, all philosophy is at fault. Its presence or its absence is all we can affirm. And as for the question of form versus form-shattering content, Emerson writes, it is not meters, but a meter-making argument that makes a poem. A thought so passionate and alive that like the spirit of a plant or an animal, it has an architecture of its own and adorns nature with a new thing. The thought and the form are equal in the order of time, but in the order of genesis, the thought is prior to the form. The poet has a new thought. He has a whole new experience to unfold. He will tell us how it was with him, and all men will be the richer in his fortune. For the experience of each new age requires a new confession, and the world seems always waiting for its poet. So we will now take you with our little roadmap through the trio so you'll have some things to listen for. Um, in the first movement, as I mentioned, this is the, the intellect uh, and this dialogue that's first going to start with cello and piano, then violin and piano, and then all of us together, um, is written in a kind of uh, writing, musical writing that is not that atypical in Ives. You'll find it particularly in this piece in the first and the last movement that the thoughts aren't necessarily logical. Um, and it's interesting that um, Ives said the following about Emerson's thought, which he, he felt was very similar to his. Ives says the following. Carlyle told Emerson that some of his paragraphs didn't cohere. Emerson wrote by sentences of phrases rather than by logical sequence. His underlying plan of work seems based on the large unity of a series of particular aspects of a subject rather than on the continuity of its expression. As thoughts surge his mind, he fills the heavens with them, crowds them in if necessary, but seldom arranges them along the ground first. Vagueness is at times an indication of nearness to a perfect truth. And uh, I'll remind you of this when we get to the third movement, but we will show you give you a little taste of the first movement. Comes the violin. It's a much more dissonant, sort of new music y kind of sound than much of what you've so far heard of Ives today. And when we get to the second movement, it's going to be a, an uproarious kind of free-for-all um, of popular tunes. In fact, um, Ives himself said, this movement reflects games and antics of students on the campus. Remember, this is, this scherzo is a joke. And Rhonda will take us through. In this movement, um, you will hear more tunes than we can count, but a few of them you might want to keep an ear out for if Bela will demonstrate. The first one is a band of brothers. <laughs> Followed by marching through Georgia. And a true favorite of mine, the worms crawl in, the worms crawl out. <laughs> my old Kentucky home. And a 
sailor's hornpipe. Followed by Pigtown Fling. <laughs> and that's followed by The Campbells Are Coming, and also, at the same time, Long, Long Ago in the Piano, and then finally, The Fountain. Yes. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Where can I find that? Uh, And at this point in the music, everybody is going nuts. Uh, this is one of those places that's kind of inchoate, um, more the expression of an inner feeling. In fact, can we try a little of that? Mm -hmm. From the end of 187, just to give you a taste. The last beat. Mm This. Let's just do from 198. It's kind of mystical music from out of nowhere. terrifying kind of cadenza in the piano, which again is, seems to be an outgrowth of whatever genie came out of a bottle right there. So if we go on from there. Thing followed by the worms come in, the worms come out. <laughs> so maybe there's some commentary there, especially because the last movement is the realm of the spirit uh, about what lasts and what doesn't. Indeed, the worms have their final say. Um, and then the last movement is a fascinating movement in many respects is a rather novel form. Again, the, the kind of form that is cumulative in that the, the punchline, so to speak, the, the essence of it seems to come at the very end with a rather magical setting of Rock of Ages. And the beginning of the movement seems to take us to uh, the bedrock of music when all is said and done, uh, which is just basically the overtone series. So and just after all of the dissonances of the first two movements, what you begin the third movement with is this. Which is all the more interesting in that the main tune in this movement, and that the tune, the tune that is worked with quite a bit, is um, one of Ives' own earlier piece is called The All Enduring. Uh, it was a piece he wrote for the Yale Glee Club, and I guess they never performed it. Perhaps they never could figure out how to do it. Um, it's on an anonymous text, and Larry will, will read it for us. Man passes down the way of years, and ruins mark his trail. He buildeth and the hand of time wipes out his structures frail. Upon the graves of greatness past, new monuments are placed, and they in turn, by fleeting years, are ruthlessly effaced. His hopes, ambitions, loves, and hates endure but a single day. Then, by the ever-busy hand of time, all are swept away. 
His glory shineth for a space and spreads its light, its brilliant light, then fades, then fades into eternal night. Thrones crumble, fall, and are no more, and nations grand decay. And power sinks to nothingness, and wealth abideth but a day. But to the world no worthy deed, no worthy thought is ever lost. Fame from its lofty pedestal disdainfully is tossed. But to the world no worthy deed or thought is ever lost. It's hard to imagine that the impact, the the meaning of that text was not in Ives' mind uh, as perhaps a hidden program because, indeed, um, the whole piece seems to set off this notion of uh, higher purpose or the the possibility of the spirit uh, versus perhaps the lower forms of of, uh, human activity. And let's just hear, in the cello, first of all, the tune that goes along with the uh, poem. Lead to an almost Wagnerian um, uh, pained and, and searching kind of music that will eventually culminate in perhaps the last word on the subject, the Rock of Ages. I believe you have a handout uh, with that tune on it. Perhaps we could all remind ourselves how that goes. Before Ives comes to this tune, he uh, he creates a tune that sounds rather similar in the piano. I'll just play that for you. It's it's very close in its character, the, the use of the interval, so that when at the end, Rock of Ages appears in the only four, in the only place in the movement it ever appears, but with this earlier presented tune by Ives himself that sounds vaguely like Rock of Ages, we have the feeling that we've heard that tune before, and it gives to the Rock of Ages a sense of, uh, um, ah, that's the meaning of this, now it all makes sense. So this is the piano version of uh, tunes probably by Ives himself. So it's it's that and that's Rock of Ages. So uh, that interval content is is worked into um, Ives' little tune in a backwards version. So it creates this subliminal connection. So let's try Rock of Ages. I'll give, uh, we'll give the um, second line as an intro. won't spoil the ending by playing it before you actually hear it in the context of the whole piece. So now this is a full performance of Ives' one and only piano trio.